Hello there and welcome to Shuttle Bay 4. This time we look at the classic Deep Space Nine episode, Little Green Men. We ask, does Deep Space Nine do the best standalone episodes? Just who is Carla Bain? And what does William Shatner smell like? <laughs> Isn't this one of the best episodes, guys? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, every totally, Star Trek fan it's... agrees. What the f are you? You're Robin and Spy. Bit Patches just said something and it just triggered something. You, you were on about, you know, it captures like that 90s sci fi vibe because sci fi just became really big at some point. And it was the X Files that triggered it. Uh, yeah. The X Files just became massive. And all of a sudden, you had loads of other stuff like that. And this actually. I didn't realise it while I was watching it last night, but it has got that kind of X Files vibe to it. It's it's sci-fi, yeah. quite serious, but also quite with it with a jokey, entertaining, you know, kind of aspect to it as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as as soon as I'll go into it in a bit in a minute, but as soon as you saw the first army officer and he's smoking, that's the smoking man. I mean, come on, that's <laughs> yeah. And and the bigger the yeah. officer, the bigger the the bigger the bollocks on the guy, the the bigger like the the head honcho, the general um, Charles Napier, I think it is smoking a cigar. So the bigger the player, the bigger the smoke. That's just tipping its hat to the X Files. I suppose one of the main things I've got to say about this episode is the fact that it does one of the things that Trek does brilliantly, which is um, kind of. Uh, explore humanity by seeing humanity through non-human eyes, which, I mean, on the bridge of the Enterprise, it did it all the time with Spock. Um, you know, instead of, I mean, it felt like that the whole reason Spock was there was to analyse humanity by having someone who wasn't human on the bridge. And you get a lot of that with this episode, because it's Ferengis talking about humans. And it's a, it sounds tough, but I can't think of any other re episode that where the whole thing is kind of told from a Ferengi point of view. I know Ferengis appeared in a lot of episodes and deliver a lot of opinions, but um, they were talking about humans and humanity. And what made me laugh is when they do go back in time to 19... Is it 1940s America? It's 1940s. 1947. 47, yeah. So it's just post-war, pre-50s, okay. They're talking about human, humans humans being savages. And they're even talking about atomic radiation. Like, what, they, they irradiated their own planet. Don't be an idiot. Um, but everything they're saying is valid. You know, they, they see us as stupid and backwards and inferior. But you can't really argue against the reasons for it. You know, the fact that we are killing ourselves and irradiating our planet and just destroying ourselves. In the 20th century, humans used crude nuclear reactors as weapons. They call them atom bombs. I think that was the main, that was my main takeaway of this episode. It was just them exploring humanity. But it wasn't all just negative either, because right at the end of the episode, I can't quite remember the line. It is in my notes somewhere um, where they're talking about humanity and they're kind of like just have kind of having a bit of banter really between them, Rom, Nog and Quark. Um, and after talking about some of the our weird foibles, Nog says, uh, but, I, but I really love them. You know, something like that. He says something about humanity, but I love them. Humans are still a bunch of violent savages. Maybe, but I like them. Um, and also this episode, it wasn't all just dark and awful because you had this aspect where the military were basically um, kind of stereotypical, I suppose, right-wing bastards. And there was a, a hint of of racism in there. You know, there was definitely some analogy with racism because they hate the, that one particular guy who hated the Ferengi, but it was all because of how they look. You know what I mean? Because they're different to us. It wasn't the fact that they were aliens. It's just because they were different. Uh, and they treated them like animals and they referred to them as it. Even though I suppose you can maybe understand that because they're, they're aliens. But um, that... That wasn't the reason why he was calling them it. It was to really, and I hate the term dehumanize because they're not human, but you know where I'm coming from when I say that, because that sort of language has been used a lot in the past against other um, aspects of humanity, you know, to dehumanize them. But the saving grace was, or the hero of this film uh, episode was that female scientist. And it was a triumph of science because it was science ultimately that, um, that thwarted this, you know, this military raid, you know, that the what the military wanted to do, and basically just 
exploit them for military technology. In fact, because Quark wants to sell stuff to them, and he, he turns around and says, look, I can sell you um, um, technology that can create food out of thin air, um, and I can... Um, I can give you technology so you can fly amongst the stars and explore new galaxies. And that military guy, the first thing he says is, What about weapons? Weapons? Hey, I'm Jenny, all right. <laughs> I like the fact that right at the beginning of the episode, Rom seems genuinely really proud of Nog. I mean, Quark kind of takes the wind out of his sails a bit, but he, he looks like a really proud dad. You know, the fact that his son's off to Starfleet. And uh, I really like that. Um, I also like the fact that Rom and Quark, Rom seems to really dislike Quark. Even suggest him at one stage once he gets his own ship. Well, you could um, fly off into the great unknown, never to return. I thought that was a, a really funny line. I enjoyed that. You could fly off into the great unknown, never to return. I like the fact that Bashir and O'Brien took time to come and see Nog and shake his hand and, you know, give him a gift. It felt as though that Nog was held in quite high regard on Deep Space Nine, and that was nice to see. Rom really stood out for me in this episode, this episode. when he's on the ship, and he's clearly a really good engineer, clearly yeah. a really good engineer. And at one stage, Quark even says, oh, bloomin' heck, you've got, some, you've got some brains on you. And he says, yeah, well, he goes, I've always had them. I've just never had the self-confidence to, you know, to do anything with it. Rom, you're a genius. And I think particularly within Star Trek fandom, there's probably a lot of people who can really identify with that. People who feel that they've never really been able to exploit the full potential because they lack self-confidence. Um, and I just felt that Rom really seemed to, to nail that in the episode. The Universal Translator, the fact that it, it balls up, I thought was was brilliant because one of the things you often hear about Star Trek as a criticism is the fact that, oh, every time they bump into a new species, you know, they're always speaking English and this, that and the other. And I thought the fact that the Universal Translator went down was absolutely superb. And what made me laugh was the fact that every time the humans saw the Ferengi, um, the Ferengi looked basically like they were stupid, right? You know, like hitting their heads and everything. But every time the Ferengi saw the humans and couldn't understand them, the humans looked stupid. And it was interesting that once you take that communication away, um, the, the you know, both of them just looked completely um, ridiculous. We get, I'm not sure if we've ever had a reference to Ferengi, Ferengi heaven and hell before, but I thought that was quite interesting. The idea of heaven is somewhere where everyone's really affluent. I can't remember what it's called. I'm sure Patches probably remembers. Uh, and the hell is somewhere where... The divine treasury. The dest yeah. So we've <laughs> yes. got the divine, divine treasury is heaven yeah. and the vault of eternal destitution being their version of hell. Yeah, I really like that. I really like that. Um, I'm, just, I'm trying to wrap it up because I don't want to bore everyone. Oh, I completely forgot Odo was in this episode, you know. And when Odo appeared, I was like, oh, shit, yeah, Odo's in it. Um, and I, I, but I thought Odo played a good part. It wasn't too big a part, which is good. He didn't take away from the Ferengi, but it was in there. Um, but, 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 but what have I got? I've got... Most of the notes I've got seem to just mirror what I've said. I know I've kind of rambled a bit, but I thought, I thought it was a really good episode. I think it's quite an entertaining episode. Um, and I think it's one of those episodes that a lot of people outside of... Star Trek fandom could probably enjoy. You don't need to know much about the Ferengi because it just it's just a good, like Patchy said, a, just a good episode of science fiction, you know. And I'm going to leave it there. Well, I'm going to tag along straight after that. At the beginning of the episode, um, the, the comedy comes in straight away with uh, Worf and the tooth sharpener thing. And I love that. I love that because you can't get any more different species than Ferengi and Klingon. And the Klingons just stood there like, this This character's got nothing I want. And as soon as he tries a tooth sharpener, he's like, how much? You know, like, shut up and take my money. That's brilliant. <laughs> how much? The racism that Dan touched on comes through this episode from start to finish. Um, so the racist, like the passive racism against the Ferengi going to Starfleet, even yeah. by the Klingon, who's, I don't believe he should, he belongs in Starfleet. And someone had to remind him, like, you know, someone would have said that about you. And um, it comes, I mean, it, it does flash all through, like, all humans look alike as well, mm. that kind of thing. Um, and I'm not forgetting that in 1947, the Klan was a thing in America. It was a massive thing. So the people that are dealing with these Martians that are, you know, the Ferengi, and they keep calling them Martians. I don't care who they are. I mean, yeah. these are the people that would be incredibly hostile to other people from the same country as them that look different, <clears throat> let alone a different planet. Um, 
and the whole like lunacy of the the pseudoscience and the attitudes behind racism is explored all the way through the episode i love that um patches just to just to mention do you know what i completely missed when you were on about you know the racism at the at the beginning of the episode about not going to the federation yeah i completely forgot about that i completely because i was just referring to when they end up on earth but yeah Yeah. it, it is really really strong at the beginning and it is you do wince at it but yeah, you're, you're I right. think I what they're mentioning. trying to say is, along with things like um, irradiating your own planet and buying poison to ingest with this, the smoking is yeah. a big thing. And Quark's like, do you know what? If they're going to buy poison, buy it and ingest hmm. it because they're addicted to it. I do well here. Yeah, it's that. It's that. It's it's kind of linking racism in with that kind of self-destructive, savage, backward, barbaric yeah attitude and and it and it brings it all in there but it does it in a star trek way yeah it doesn't smash it into your face like a brick it's kind of like laced all the way through the episode woven into the fabric of it and i like that um the split up of jake and nog um and their little spot on the promenade right at the beginning of the episode that's quite a nice moment um Again, there's a, there's a bit of a role reversal. So Jake Sisko, you think his dad's a big time captain of a frontier space station, uh, an officer of note. He's not interested in Starfleet at all. He wants a career or a job or a life outside of that. And Nog, the Ferengi, who should be obsessed with profit, wants to join Starfleet. And that role reversal, that's really good. And and now it's coming to fruition. They're splitting up these two characters. We've gone into the, the smoking bit. Um, the cigarette smoking man and that nod to the X Files. Um, the, like everyone who isn't from the future is profusely smoking to the point where a guy lights two cigarettes and gives one to his to his missus. I haven't done that for a very very long time, and it kind of took me back. Um, but the bigger the the bigger the player in the episode, the bigger the smoke. And the general's got the the quintessential, you know, the cigar, um, and. It's that that kind of prop runs through to to separate barbarity from modern thinking. This constitutes first contact for the human race as well. So this whole X-Files thing with Roswell and the New Mexico thing and Area 51, and it was actually Quark, um, that Star Trek taking ownership of something that kind of spurred a whole, it was almost a decade of sci-fi and that kind of, program because the x-files was so big the outer limits came back the twilight zone came back all of these things came back because the x-files just it was the right thing at the right time there was just a gap in the market for something interesting kind of sci-fi and i think star trek was basically saying through this episode you know we've been doing this a long time you know you might have some something that's hot a hot product right now but we've been here for years the part where the nurse says, you know, uh, we're going to explore new new worlds and new civilizations and all of that kind of stuff. I thought that was a little bit too cheesy for me. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was almost like the um, the Peter Griffin thing where he laughs because they say the title of the movie in the movie. And he's like, yeah, hey, I usually only get this excited when they say the title of a movie in the movie. I'm telling you, these drug dealers represent a clear and present danger. Yeah, yeah, he said it. He said it. It wasn't. It wasn't as bad as those Star Trek First Contact. So where Stephen Cochran says, "So you're on some kind of Star Trek?" <laughs> yeah, so a space voyage, a Star Trek. Yeah, that was. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't as bad as that. You're all astronauts on some kind of Star Trek. Or maybe it was as bad as that. It was. It was cheap. worse. No, it wasn't as bad. That Stephen Cochran's was worse. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think the Divine Treasury, the Vault of Eternal Destitution, the whole Ferengi religion, why aren't we bidding on our new life? Um, and the way that they explain that very quickly, the bar was showing a profit. We're not going to hell. So if you die when you're in profit, <laughs> yeah. you can have another life. If you're if you're if you're potless, you get nothing. You go to hell. And that's their version of morality. That's brilliant. Um, again, they it's it's a. It's an exploration of humanity through that that alien set of eyes. And for some people, that is their mission in life. That is their idea of heaven, is 
a lot of dosh here and right here, right now. That is the most important thing. That is all there is. There is nothing else. There's nothing after life. There's that is. I've got to make what I can now. And the Ferengis are definitely they're on that. Oh yeah, it's a night off episode. I thought this was a massive saying to uh, um, all the cast basically: Bashir, Worf, the captain, um, Kira, everyone. Like you'll be in the first scene. You get your credit, you'll be in there, you'll get paid, but then take the rest of the night off. You won't be in any more of this episode. So just just relax. You know, hang around the studio, whatever. Take take yeah. a couple of days and we'll do this thing yeah. with uh with not Bob. you, Renee. Not you, Renee, come back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and it was that. And they kind of did flick through the guest star list and they come up with Charles Napier again. So I don't know how many people have been in in uh, the original series and the Rick Berman era, but he is, you know, the hippie with Herbert, mm. and and he comes back as as this general, and he's, you know, two character, two two more different people. You can't imagine, can you? A 1950s <laughs> cigar smoking, racist, brutalizing, weapon obsessed general, and a space hippie in a in a mankini. I mean, <laughs> um. In amongst all of the the stories it played out, talking about him was this army guy, and they kept sticking quark with the needles, and it wasn't working. And Armin Shimmerman's scream when he gets stabbed with a needle is priceless, and he screams all the way through the episode. Actually, he's just not liking it. Um, but this whole thing about you know the holding of the scalpel up to the neck and and all of that kind of stuff. I know they've only got forty five minutes, but yeah, tell me what you want, you Martian bastard, and all of this lot. I thought that was rushing it a little bit. It could have been a bit more cerebral, a bit more threat, and less, you know, knife to the throat. And uh, the last thing that I've got, that I'll leave it on because I'm rambling a bit, is um, the situation with Rom at the end. That wry grin, as he said, I'll get you a lawyer from cousin such and such, a bloke who's just tried to kill them. Yeah. And as he's marched around the corner, that that smile from Rom is now. I'm not going to go into this too much. There's a guy where I work, and he he's been around for a very long time in this job, and nobody asks him to do very much because he plays the buffoon. He's no fool. He's a genius, in fact. He knows this job through and through and he's been there and he's seen it and he's done it. And there isn't a thing that he hasn't done or doesn't know how to do. But I think he plays the fool a little bit. So he's the last person anybody asks to do anything because, oh, no, no, we're not going to ask him because I was just, just even to talk to him is just too much trouble. And I've actually seen that grin on his face when someone's looking for someone to do something Pass it, scans past it, no, not you, and goes to someone else. That grin of, yeah, keep on trucking. And Rom's got that kind of, everyone takes him for a very stupid buffoon, but he's not. Bearing in mind, he's just come up with time travel on a fag packet design in a shuttlecraft <laughs> with some, do you know what I mean? He's just invented it in his in, off the hoof. We need a nuclear bomb, some chemocyte, we need this, that, and the other. And if we do this, and then we'll travel in time to that exact point. And that puts him in the realms of Spock, actually. Spock, you know, he took a, a few hours, let me do my computations to do the time jump. Ron was like, yeah, now, we'll go, we'll go now. We'll do it now. We'll do it in seven minutes. I'll, I'll take us back, no problem. So Ron's some kind of heavy genius. And that Roy grin at the end of this episode, I don't think it was expanded on too much, but he is uh, he's nobody's fool. And it, it was just... Max's way of getting that in there. Like he doesn't actually play a complete buffoon. He plays someone playing a buffoon, if you like. And I like that a lot. Um, one of my all-time favorite episodes of Star Trek, for all the reasons that I've said to do with the X-Files and the nod to the the sci-fi, the the comedy, real powerhouse performances. Um, real, you know, there's some funny stuff in there with the, the Universal Translator. How does it work? to explain that they said well it's easy when you know how and i thought <laughs> uh you know i was just like oh, come on that's the only hole and it's a massive hole in the plot but 
it's the way it worked and it worked out well and it's a it's a good fun episode as you say it doesn't need to you don't need a trekkie you don't need anyone that's followed any of it to get it and uh i think anyone if they can be bothered would really enjoy the episode (laughs) (laughs) and that is my take on little green men i love it well, I lasted all of 60 seconds before I burst into tears. Uh, First thing I've ever seen. I, I didn't even finish what we left behind because when he came on, that was it. I went, I had gone. So it took me all of a minute to start crying and then compose myself. So Jed's written the first few notes on account of I'm busy with the tissue. I know. I noticed, let's say, when, he, when Nog's selling all his stuff, I've never seen so much tap for a kid. They want the real deal. It looked like some old lady's house had been ransacked yeah. and put on a table. I oh, don't know. He said something about Krampus horns, and I'm like, what are you on about? What's that? <laughs> the two the gold big, horns. big, massive golden horns <laughs> on the end of the table. For a kid, what's what's he want with them? There was a lot of crap on that table. But I did notice the, 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 the war thing. And he said he didn't want Ferengis. It was like, how, how can you... Say that mm. being the only Klingon in Starfleet to turn around and say you don't want Ferengis in Starfleet. That was a bit, but yeah, really enjoyed this episode. I stopped writing notes after that. I just got into the episode because I love it. It's just one of them. It's like the, the space hippies. I just thought Jesus is one of his relatives is flying around in space in a <laughs> Gina later, but. <laughs> <laughs> and he does look a lot different when not bushier. Yeah. yeah. It's difficult to actually, uh, just in your mind, just kind of equate both of those characters to the same actor. I know there's obviously a, a few decades between it, but they're just, the characters are so different. They look completely different. The only thing that gives it away is kind of like jawline he's got, you know. But yeah, with, with Ron, Ron's the MacGyver of Deep Space Nine. <laughs> <laughs> just time travel. Like, why did I just hear the word why did I just hear the word tools, <laughs> <laughs> tools. <laughs> just invented it straight off the bat <laughs> tools Spock's there doing computations for ages and he just yeah oh keep sight that boss there we go yeah but yeah I love the episode Dee forgot old dog was in it no, I didn't forget Odo was in it. I forgot Odo was the dog. Oh, I forgot to take that thing with them. The amount of times I've seen this episode, and I still, when he stood up, when the dog went, I was going to eat him. And then he turned into Odo. I was like, completely forgot that bit happened. Yeah. Didn't occur to me that the dog was Odo at all, because in the beginning, him and Quark are having a chat at the bar and he's like, oh, it's a good idea. You've got more to mind the bar. Very trusting of your, you know, whole safe travels and we'll see you when you get back. So it never occurs to you that he's gone, nah, you're not going anywhere without me, lad. But yeah, the, the sexism was there as well from that era. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Oh, you beautiful angel. Shut up and stand in the corner now. But yeah, I loved it. I always, it's one of my favourite this. Pale Moonlight and a few of the others. Uh, yeah. Brilliant episodes. I love the bit when Narg was in the ship and they were like, you're smuggling chemosite. And he was like, well, I'd like 20%. And he was, um, okay, and what about you then? And he goes, well, I'm... and his voice changes, if you've noticed. Instead of it being Ferenge, it goes all official <clears throat> and it drops. He starts talking all official. It's like, well, as a Starfleet cadet, it's my duty to report any violation of Federation law to my superiors immediately. He gets this official Starfleet voice and then he turns and starts talking. Well, with me 10 percent, he's back to his Ferengi yeah. tone. Almost confirming the racial stereotype that it was labeled upon him like on his way to join Starfleet and live that next chapter of in his life. He's going to be smuggling chemosite on the way for 10 percent. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bit like yeah. in like some TV series and some old films. I mean, thankfully, it doesn't really happen now, where you'll get the stereotypical like some like strong Jewish accent to say, you know, and it's just it's awful to watch, you know, when you get people are like de- meant to represent someone who's just obsessed with money or whatever. 
I think Odo played a very small part in this. He could have been yeah. a rat in the room and saved Quark from being tortured and stabbed with needles, but he didn't appear for that. And it was, again, it was a very 1950s kind of thing where they're talking to the scientist and the nurse outside the hangar where the ship is. And Odo's going, he's just kind of looking out and he's, okay, Quark, let's go. When he said his piece. Yeah, instead of going, wait for him to finish talking rather than just pushing him. Get on with it. He just waits. He's looking. Yeah, apart, yeah literally just out. pushing his, get, shut, shut up and get in yeah. there. Just get <laughs> There was no need for Odo to be in this episode, was there, really? I mean, you could have... He didn't really do anything. I know, obviously, he maybe played a part in it, but you could easily have written him out. He didn't, he didn't need think, to be in it. I think it was a super good reveal, because you, do, you don't ever consider Odo could have smuggled himself. Exactly. So, exactly. But I don't know. They didn't do anything with him, you're right. Mm. And he didn't, really, he didn't do anything necessary for even to be there, you know. I think the only thing as well with the do- him being the dog, I think that goes back to like the thing. That reminded me of the thing. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah I didn't think of that. Yeah. Um, the only yeah, thing that's my ad of it is um, in between scenes, you get like cheesy 60s, 70s sitcom music. I never noticed that. that. Film music, yeah, yeah. You get, you it do was get like, a bit of that. what? Can't you roll that? Why is it there? And who's put that in? Because you're wrong. That ed- that <laughs> music editing's bang out. <laughs> Seth MacFarlane uses a lot of that in Family Guy. That kind of, you know, like between scenes, you get an outside view of the house, like the Golden Girls almost. That yeah, do 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 do, and then zoom into the house for the next. Skit yeah, they, comedy. It's, it's sort of in the next one, but you, where, what, where's that music come from? Who's decided that that was suitable? Because you're wrong. You're very wrong. <laughs> Use something else. Anything <coughs> but that. It just, I don't know. It, it, um, it decreases its value for me slightly. Yeah. You think? I think oh, in this sorry. episode, if they were instant the music. Yeah, if they were really tipping their hat, they'd have had Act One, Act Two, Act Three, Epilogue, you know, and <laughs> they'd have done that all the way through. Um, Invaders. Yes! That's one of my favourites yeah. ever. Is it really? Yeah. Uh, do you know what? Do you know one of the things I hate? Oh, do you remember the Invaders? And everyone looks at you like, what are you talking about? I love the Invaders. And I'm like, how could you not know about that? It's like, that's just, that's the genesis of it. That's brilliant. I love, yeah. The Invaders. Sweet. Love that, bros. <laughs> the Invaders. But all in all, it is one of my favourite episodes. And not yeah. just Scott. See, Steve, I told you. What? Shut up. Are you still here? <laughs> and you got to what you've said in about an hour. <laughs> Well, I knew the moment I opened my mouth, I'd get lambasted anyway. So it just oh, made more well, sense for you good. lot to finish dribbling over this <laughs> episode and move on. Well, do you want to say anything about this episode, Steve? No. <laughs> <laughs> Out of all of them, Deep Space Nine does the best standalone episodes. And I've through Shuttle Bay 4, I've discovered that. Yeah, Thinking I think you're right, actually. A standalone yeah. episode from Disco, it's impossible. Um, it's interesting from... as well, because Deep Space Nine is the one series that, before Disco then, it was made as... It was a serial. Art, you know what I mean? But it has, like you say, it has got some amazing one-off episodes. I think they can do it better, because the one advantage they've got here, which they haven't got ever, is they're on a space station, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's not always based on a ship that you've got to include the ship in. Yeah, yeah. And, and and in fact, the space station after the credits just vanished from, and it wasn't required, you know. Mm. And we're on the back lot, we're on the Paramount back lot again. Yeah. Um, I think uh, this, uh, as as uh, Jed said, the pale moonlight, the the best standalone episodes do do spawn from Deep Space Nine, and I think the writing power is there and the scope is there, and they're not afraid to do comedy. I think the next gen, every time they went near comedy. It, Pumped badly. Often, like, yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's not, you know, none of those actors could pull it off. Or, and I don't know if everyone in Deep Space Nine could pull off comedy. You know what I mean? I don't think Cisco in a comedic setting 
And in fact, the more dramatic he gets, he actually becomes an internet meme. Me. God. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, it's 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 real, you know, that kind of thing. And, you can, and I, he uses his voice in a really, really unique way, doesn't he? Yeah, it's it's, so it's, like it's a, real. Yeah, it's yeah. I, I still, I'd love him though. I think I'd love to meet that guy. He's one of my heroes. Really? Yeah, he's like he is that eccentric, intriguing person. I would love to have around the dinner table. I've seen him in um, something with, like. I think it was William is Shatner. Shatner one? Yeah, yeah. That, that is, and again, how eccentric is you know? This is William Shatner interviewing him, but yeah. you, like you don't even notice William Shatner because he, this guy is so eccentric, and I can't take my eyes off him. I love him. Hi, Kitty. She's just chlorinated chair. Chlorinated chair. Oh God, you can't do that with our cats. You'd, have, you'd lose your face by now. <laughs> <laughs> God, God, could you imagine trying to do that with Fred? Um, Patches, one thing you said there, which I never really thought about before, is you're on about the fact that uh, in terms of standalone episodes, Deep Space Nine does it better than anyone else. And I'm just wondering, do you think it's because in all the other series, you've almost got the same kind of characters? I mean, if you look at TNG yeah, straight away, I, I you can I didn't date as you spot. Right, you've you've kind of got certain personalities that appear in all the series. Whereas with Deep Space Nine, it's completely different. In none of the other series, if you've got a Garak character, in no other series, if you've got somebody who could literally kill people, right, and just get and still appear in another episode, and people still love them. You yeah. don't you don't have a Quark character. You don't even have no. like an Odo character. You don't have an you know, Odo, definitely. It's exactly, it is Deep Space Nine. It's, it's so it's so <laughs> tower. It's, <laughs> if the closest to Garak in TNG would be Law, with that kind of cheeky mischievous. Kind genius. of, but then yeah, but oh, again, but Law, he, is, but Law, he's Law is definitely. But equally, I think, I think equally, the fact that it is a station means it's a thoroughfare. You've you've got, yeah. got resident shops. So on all of the other episode, or on all of the other series, that is a Starfleet vessel traveling somewhere so they're they're essentially yeah. just passing through whereas with this you've got residents of all you know alien races with all sorts of methodologies and all sorts of values so they're able to introduce less starfleet style ideals into into yeah. the mix then allows them to play with the episodes a lot more I mean, it's, it's they're factor. using really established kind of narratives. So, the original Star Trek, the original series, was like a like like rawhide in space. You know, traveling through the frontier, encountering new things, different things every week. It'd be a different thing. And the next generation is definitely that reinvented. Um, and and as Dan said, the characters just ported over to something new. I think the, about the only difference that you had in the next generation was the boy wonder, the Wesley Crusher thing. Um, and that didn't really work. So they binned it. This is <laughs> like the, 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 the outpost, the frontier fort right on the edge of civilization where you've got a bit of trade with whatever's beyond the frontier. They're all savages and the, you know, different cultures coming through and you are kind of, you know, you can imagine like the, the guys in the cavalry outfit with a little cavalry flag riding out every, but coming back there, and they're kind of they're part of this bigger thing, but they're on their own. They're right on the arse end of it, and they're vulnerable. And I think they took a, a a pretty good move to ditch that recipe, which come back for Enterprise, probably why a lot of people struggle with it because it's rehashed, but not as good. Um, but this took a departure from that set piece crew. The you know the Spock data character, uh, the ladies man, the the doctor, the you know the, the engineer, and I've I've even put in some of my suggestions to rank things: the doctor, the engineer, the captains. You know, it's it's that thing. But in this, they, I mean, they didn't even have a captain to start with. They had a commander, and he was reluctant. He wasn't chomping at the bit to be the best he could be. He was like, oh, I'll do it for for now. I don't. And he even said to Picard in the first episode, I don't want your f***ing station. I don't want your federation. I'm not interested in any of you. I don't like you. I don't like your station. I don't like none of it. And I'll do it because I've got to. I'm being helped, though. Yeah. 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 
Well, there, are, there aren't really a stand. There isn't a standalone episode. I think there was one. I'm sure it's. I remember watching an, an episode of Discovery that I thought, oh, this is actually like the most Star Trek kind of episode. It was when um, Pike was in it. Sorry, my cat's walking across my desk. Um, <laughs> Pike was in it. And um, uh, they visited a planet. I can't quite remember the details of it, but I remember it was a bit of a standalone episode. But I remember online a lot of people slagged it off saying, this isn't Discovery. And I'm thinking, oh, this is great because it feels a bit more like Star Trek. Do you think yeah, they, they was... tried to do with disco what they were doing what they had done with because obviously ds9 had that continuity and maybe they were trying to transfer that to a ship i i, I think i think tv changed so yeah i think it's just tv Everything itself changed i mean it's, a it's kind of like it was like the, the the breaking bad thing weren't it breaking bad they say you know change tv forever i mean with the way we consume tv is different now it's not you don't have to wait for the following week and even if they are released every week you don't have to sit down at a specific time or you miss it you know it's there so i i think i think your yeah, tv change oh, the cat is putting their feet in what is remaining of a cup of tea i've got she's got this thing where she puts her feet <laughs> in and goes you don't even like tea <laughs> there's a lot of shows that um the Sopranos, like HBO shows, are really good for that. The Sopranos was a binge-worthy show. Um, Breaking Bad was binge-worthy. There was a few really good powerhouse shows that that kind of turned TV into the binge, the box set binge. Yeah. And Netflix really took off buying that catalog and sticking it on their service because people were binging their service on a regular. Um, which is why I don't think we'll ever get back to the 25, 26 episode situation. Um, mm. I, and I also think that we're going to have to have that serialized. I mean, Strange New Worlds has come out of that a little bit, maybe a bit too far with the musical thing. I don't, I don't know what that was, but um, <laughs> it's uh, I, I, a lot's riding on Strange New Worlds. Um, and, and I guess Lower Decks as well. Um, I mean, I've got a lot more time for Lower Decks as time goes on. And the theme tune's been in my head all day, for instance, and I don't know why, because I haven't really been watching it, but it's got a very sticky theme tune as well. I think, for me, it's it's those are the two vehicles that's going to carry Star Trek forward. To the end of this rendition. Just got to wait this one out. But then we'll be in, we'll be in production Zy- Siberia for a bit. When uh, Strange New Worlds folds and the the Kurtzman era finishes that there won't be any Star Trek for a good long good. while. Well, I don't, hopefully we'll have the Terra Metallis um, era and it'll all come back. Have you heard the rumours about this film today? I've heard uh, there's going to be another yeah, film oh, set in the Kelvin verse, but a prequel. Now oh. I'm not particularly. I oh. know oh, yeah, that was my oh, yeah. kind of no, reaction. No, we don't need that. All... I don't want anything Kelvin, like because they still no. they, they actually are. In pre-production, in there for the Section Thirty One movie as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, think the reason that I think the reason that reason that's got made is because I think it kind of got shelved. I think because Michelle Yeoh all of a sudden became massive, yeah. um, even Maybe. though she's been. Around, I mean, a lot of us remember from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, you know. Yeah. Um, but all of a sudden, she's become, you What's know, you a list. Yeah. Exactly. I yeah. Because of that. If Zach Quinto and the rest of the cast do another star trek i mean I've, I've got no time for the kelvin timeline films at all they're pain they're they're painful they are shit but if they were to do it again they'd only be doing it for the paycheck and it mm-hmm. would show on screen you know i don't think there's any real passion for the for the franchise from these people and zachary quinto there is definitely because he attends a lot of conventions uh, uh, Carlo Bain as well, Carl Urban, Carlo Bain. He's he's Carlo he's Bain. big into it. What the fuck? What? <laughs> Carlo Bain. Carlo Bain, yeah, he's. Carlo Bain. Who was Carlo Bain? Is he Russian? Carl Urban then. Um, <laughs> what's his name? <laughs> it's Carl Urban. Yeah. I'd say Carl Urban as well. I'd say Carl. Not Carlo Bain. I'm That's sure his Carl sister. Urban says Carl Urban as so. well. I've seen him at a con, and he's into it. Yeah, um, he loves it. He does really like it. Yeah. And, and I love it. He is into it. And he's, he's into it in that Anson Mount it. kind of way as well. Do you know what I mean? He's like, wow, this is amazing. He's We're looking at him as the star, and he's looking at us as the fandom from the stage going, wow, this is brilliant. That's the one um, thing I love about Star Trek conventions. The amount, you don't expect it. And there's certain actors you would never expect it from, but they give you that love. They give you that, like, oh, my God, I'm amazed that you've turned up and, you know, that you're all here and you're here for yeah. me. 
Oh, you like, yeah, totally. like um, I think I, I, I don't know if it will be a box office flop. What are you pointing at over there? What are you laughing at, you pair of bitches? Yeah. I think they're laughing at, at this thing here that keeps yeah. keeps attacking yeah, me. I'm yeah. just watching Dan's Can cam. We? I've just seen an arm go past his head. <laughs> an orb. Really, really slow, like, yeah, real slow, like, <laughs> in that, diamond, th- that direction. Like, sure. Stop it, cat. Down like that. What did you see? An orb. <laughs> an orb. <laughs> Oh, yeah, okay. not like a light refraction. It was a proper. D. Oh, J. J. Abrams. D. You're a, you're a married woman. You shouldn't be looking at my orbs. <laughs> I'm just pissing my sides at the cat, pissing about with your camera. Uh, well, she's just sat down now, but she was she's just crawling around. It's because I'm not get, If she can hear me talking, but not giving her attention, she starts just getting naughty. That's what, she's just sat down now, bored, <laughs> under my monitor. Anyway, sorry, patches. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I completely finished with you ridiculing my pronunciation of Carl Urban. Carl, Carl are you sure it's not like Carl Urban? <laughs> I, I, do you know what? I can't wait to meet him and say, hey, Carl Urban. Yeah. He'd be like, <laughs> and fuck him too. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? Okay, I didn't, you've covered loads, um, so I'll just go from what I noticed on the episode. I think um, for Nog's character, I love the beginning and the fact he's being sent off to Starfleet, or he's choosing to go to Starfleet. And I think for the for the character, and just as Nog, you know, it's like so brave of him to choose to go and live on Earth, go into the Academy. It's like nothing he's ever experienced before in his life, but I think it's super brave. And it, it really is like an amazing arc for that character. Um they mention a bit about Quark's cousin Gala, and I like because they mention as well that uh, Quark had borrowed him the money so that he could set up this. It's like an arms something or other, and I like because that ties into a future episode where, like, Quark loses favor on the station because he starts selling guns. He's using like his holo holodeck to do it, and he, and so I like the tie into that future episode. Um, while they're on Earth. So, I, again, there's always, I think in Star Trek, this is really common theme as well. There's always an emphasis that humans progress so quickly. Like, oh, just in this 400 years, they go from this to this. And there's always, like in all Star Trek, there's always this, humans are progressing so, so quickly. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I guess, it's, <laughs> well, I guess it's a positive outlook, which is what Star Trek's about. And, you know, we all hope and aim for this future been a possibility but it's funny how much that comes up in star trek throughout every series there's always some mention here or there about oh yeah you in a hundred years humans are going to be like q it's like yeah right well but there's also the mention of they are savage and bigoted and well, they go, yeah, but and that's also, that is also emphasizing that point because it's like yeah we've gone from being savages to having warp drive and being one of the dominant races in this quadrant in this very short space of time where they say even vulcans you know they've had 1500 years or whatever it is and so yeah there's always that kind of emphasis on that um quark's realization that humans are stupid is really funny you can just see it in his face and his mind ticking over and he's just like, oh, <laughs> Latin. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the nurse. So you've mentioned the nurse and some of her really tropey sayings that she comes out with, which again, harks for me, harks back to the 50s. These characters, I think, that they've given us, like the guest characters, play their roles really well, but also they like the ultimate tropes of, you've got like the really hard-nosed general, You've got this, his little grunt who's evil, you know, and loves his job. <laughs> You've got the nurse who's, it's always the woman that's like the philosophical one who looks towards the future. Um, and she just reminded me immediately of Edith Keeler. It's like, oh, that's a, that's a hard fact to Edith <laughs> Keeler, giving her speech about traveling to the stars. Um, Rom, Rom cracks me up all the time, but I love, because this happens much more often than in this episode, how... You only got to look at him and he cracks under pressure and just tells you everything, absolutely everything. And he just <laughs> punches it out really fast, as quickly as he can, and he's going to tell you everything right now. <laughs> and that's one of my, like. I want my Moogie. Moogie? In every episode he does it, it's genius because he is such a good actor. And um, he definitely does it in this episode. They literally look at him and go, oh my God, I don't know what happened. We come to the future and we're just here to do this. <laughs> 
And it was Odo's turn, I noticed, to do the double fist punch in this episode. That might, that might be Odo's first double fist punch, I'm not sure. Talk amongst yourselves. Well, while you're doing that brush, I'm just going to showcase something I mentioned to Patches the other day. Uh, this is a Christmas present, not this year, but about four years ago. Um, if you can see that, this is... Uh, oh. a, a while ago, they brought out some Star Trek fragrances. There was a female one called Ponfar. And this one is called James T. Kirk for, ah! men, <laughs> for men and captains. Now, there are female captains, so I'm assuming it's maybe a bit unisex. It doesn't smell unisex. It smells very, like, stereotypically, you know. William Shatner. James, yeah, it, smells like, it smells like Shatner. But this Oda is the, Shatner. Like, Oda Shatner. Um, Oda the womanizer. Here we go. Um, <sighs> it's actually quite cool because it's in a like a communi communicator shaped bottle. Oh, look at that. You, you like it now. Let's give a quick. Oh, there was, there was a quick smell. Oh, it smells like it smells like men and captains to me. <laughs> I will. How I will many bring, of them have you? <laughs> I will bring this with me to the convention. And if you want to smell like a man, like a man, like like a man or a captain, <laughs> I don't mind giving you a quick spray. Quick. Give it as a squirt. Oh, That's one way to get rid of the cat. <laughs> Humans are still a bunch of violent savages. Maybe. But I like them.